the Ballad of Johnny Arcane. Chapter 20, Ambush on the Onyx Highway, <clears throat> Part 2. In Johnny's dream, Lucy is riding a pony across a narrow bridge with no railing. A lone vulture is circling overhead. Lucy's hair is longer now. It falls across the pony's flank, and a bright purple scarf is tied around her forehead. The vulture drops something from its beak. It looks like a fiery ring, like the sun, if its center were blackened. It falls, spiraling, disappears into a roiling cauldron of clouds below. At that moment, the bridge begins to sway and tremble. Earthquake, cries Mars. The pony stumbles to its knees, and Lucy is thrown from its back. <clears throat> Johnny felt a tug, then a shove. He opened his eyes. He was lying on a platform in the back of the wagon. Mars was standing over him, dressed in an outfit that he hadn't seen before. The sleeves hung open like drapes, and the fabric was embroidered with eyes, animal eyes of many shapes, round, almond, some compound like insects, some irises slit like reptiles. A collar of brown feathers ringed his neck, and a leather belt slung around his waist, hanging with knives. He had removed his headband and teased his hair into a shiny black bristle. Clear light. Get up. They're coming. Johnny and Mars stood on the bluff, facing east. A cloud of dust hung over the canyon and they could see the distant figures moving along the roadbed like an army of black ants marching. We don't have a plan, Johnny said. We don't need a plan. We have the power of love. You take the big knife, the one I got from trade in the, in the trash hills. I'll hitch up the horse. We'll go down and meet them where the road comes out into the plain. They started down. Trespasser could sense the excitement and smell the danger. His nostrils flared and his gait was brisk. Johnny sat on the buckboard holding the big knife in both hands. It had no sheath and the cold of its blade entered his fingers and traveled up his arms. His entire awareness was focused sharply on the present moment. Everywhere he turned, he experienced color and detail. The jagged outline of the boulders, the dry smell of dust, the dizzying sensation of descent as the road dropped steadily toward the plain. Where the onyx highway spilled out of the canyon, it cut a straight line to the spires of iron weed. Someone had planted a makeshift wooden placard here with a painted, painted warning. Turn back now. At the center of the clearing, directly behind the sun, they parked the wagon. There was grass growing, so Mars unbridled trespasser and let him graze. Johnny took a position beside the wagon, his back to the canvas, his eyes fixed on the canvas opening on the canyon's opening, I'm sorry. She said, if I had to kill anyone, kill the man they call Glass Darkly. But how will I know him? Mars shifted his weight. That's easy. He'll be the only one on a horse, a white horse. He stole it from Mab back in domination. One thought turned over three times in Johnny's mind. I am going to kill a man. On the third turn, the words changed. I am going to kill a bird. 
He had killed birds before, out of necessity. It wasn't long before they heard, I'm sorry, it wasn't long before they could hear them, a sound, it wasn't long <laughs> before they could hear them, a sound somewhere between the rumbling of a wildfire and the pearl of distant thunder, peal of distant thunder. Soon the dust began to roll out of the canyon. Certain images flowed unchecked, each briefly, one following the other. Lucy singing, Begone, begone, the mud of sorrow. The amber glass bottle under the mattress, and the first night they made the untuned music, and the many nights that followed, and the sweet deep tuning of their bodies together each night when the music fell silent. Lucy, moving the dough through the air, assigning each movement a name, rocking the baby, sending out the lambs, calling the falcons, Lucy, the blue ceramic bowl behind the cabin for raccoons only, the, lady, the ladles singing in the continuous rain, singing her name, Lucy, Lucy. The memories soothed him. His heart softened. He settled into a place of peace and pleasure so deep that he almost missed the moment the figures first emerged from the canyon, thrusting him violently back into the here and now. At first, they didn't appear as individuals. It was more like a black tar oozing out of the screen of brown dust. The pointed hoods were the first features to manifest. The figures marched so close, their shoulders touched, their pace swift and relentless, pressing forward, blindly obedient. But then something happened. Some in the forefront caught sight of a disturbance in the way things should be. A horse grazing, a wagon, two men holding knives. The front line faltered. Those that followed, still oblivious, stumbled into them. From behind rows, march of, behind, from behind, rows of marchers propelled by momentum and unable to pass through the obstruction poured around the sides. There were shouts and grumbles and a new movement at the front. Another phalanx of black coats broke through. Smaller, sprier, their hoods covering their heads, their faces to the ground. They poured out into the clearing a good distance before realizing they had broken from the flow. There was confusion. Some stopped and tried to press back. Others began waving their arms. A few sat on the ground. But one leaned forward, stared straight at the wagon, and screamed, Johnny! Johnny felt the earth dissolve under his feet. Lucy! He took a step forward, and Mars' strong arm grasped him by his shoulder. Don't! Commotion, voices raised, the rustling of bodies, then another sound the high, wild scream of a horse and the stomping of hooves. Black coats cringed and scattered. Some fell to the ground as the great white stallion po pounded through their ranks, thrashing and writhing and baring its yellow teeth. The rider wore no hood. His hair and beard were as dark and shiny as the black rock, and his eyes were piercing. At the sight of the wagon, the stallion balked, and the rider jabbed at it with his ankles. There were blades on his boots, and the horse's flanks were scarred and bloody. Johnny felt a poke in the small of his back. He thought it might be the tip of Mars's knife, but that didn't matter. What it felt like was the urgent prick of courage, born not of vanity, but of sheer necessity. He stepped forward and stared the rider straight in the face. I know you, glass darkly.
The writer's face ruptured into a contemptuous grin. I know you too, Johnny Arcane. Almost friendly, the voice was surprisingly thin, empty of resonance. The girl just confirmed my suspicions. The words flew unbidden from Johnny's mouth. The girl also told me that if I were to kill you, the others would have no one to follow and the captives would escape. Glass darkly raised his eyebrows and a shadow crossed his face. That's not true, he said sharply, and he reined the horse in a full circle to scan the panorama of faces behind him. My men are loyal. And anyway, you can't kill me. I'll kill you first. Let's find out. Come down. Show me your weapon. A disturbance of voices rippled through the crowd behind the horse and rider. Johnny couldn't clearly discern the mood. Fists were clenched, but at whom? Provocation, encouragement, resentment, anxiety. Bodies began to jostle erratically. A few people shoved. Some tried to flee, but others restrained them. All still first, all still, I'm sorry, all fell still when glass darkly slipped from the horse, landed softly on his boots, and opened wide his two bare arms, his hands, two bare hands. These are my weapons, he said. Your childish dagger cannot touch them. Johnny felt the pressure of a hand between his shoulder. Mars whispered in his ear. Weak spot, left side of the neck, from behind. Don't let him touch your legs. Glass darkly advanced, his arms spread wide, his fingers splayed. Johnny saw the flow of black robe bodies fanning out, circling around. Some had thrown off their hoods. Others were gesturing inexplicably and shouting words he did not recognize. He sensed Mars had moved away behind him, and he heard the clink of the reins. But mostly, Johnny focused on the man who stood before him, his combatant. He shifted his weight toward the man. He gathered his arms inward, moving the dough. Johnny thought, I don't know this man. I have no feelings for him. I have no rage, no resentment, no anger. I have only a duty to carry out. He ducked swiftly even before the arm was swung, then dropped to the ground, scrambled to his feet, and found himself at the man's back. Glass darkly spun around with both arms swinging. One fist struck Johnny's ear. There was a moment of darkness, followed by a flash of light and a film of blood across his eyes. He raised his knife above his head. They had traded places. Behind Darkly's approaching bulk, Johnny caught a glimpse of the wagon and Mars cinching the reins on Trespasser's bridle. Johnny brought the knife down full force and felt the hand grasp his arm so tightly his wrist went rip limp and the dagger fell to the ground. He slammed his foot on its blade and an image flashed through him. The silo at King Corn, his arms around the beehive, releasing himself into the hoop. He willed his body to fold. Kicking blows pummeled him on the way down, but he clamped the hilt in one hand. With the other, he made a fist and slammed it full bore into Glass Darkly's kneecap. The knee buckled. The man staggered. Johnny took the opportunity to jump behind his left side and slung the blade swiftly at the flesh below the left the man's left ear. It was like sinking an axe into a soft green log. The blade stuck, lodged horizontally in the man's neck. Johnny couldn't pull it out, and around its point of entry, a trickle of blood began to form. One scream, then another, then another, and soon the air was filled with voices, 
howling and screaming like a pack of wolves. Darkly's eyes bulged, his arms swung loosely like empty sleeves in the wind. He opened his mouth and his tongue moved, trying to form a word. Then suddenly he sagged and became unbearably heavy, all of his weight hanging from Johnny's grasp on the knife. Johnny let go. As the body struck the ground, there was a rush of air from the lungs, shaping a single throatless word. Bezel. Johnny's stomach turned. The sensation of the knife entering the flesh repeated itself in an endless loop until it forced a mass of bile up through his torso and out of his mouth. He fell to his knees, retching violently. His arms became eels. They tried to wrench themselves from their sockets. He fell on his face and the earth pitched forward. He thought he might fall into the sky. Clear light, get up. He lifted his head, but he could not support his body on his elbows. Everywhere, black coats were running, fleeing in all directions with the ululations of excitement and terror. Lucy was right. If he killed the men, the others would have no one to follow, and the captives might escape. Lucy! He tried to cry, but his voice would form no more than a gagging whimper. Clear light! Get up! Get on the wagon! He turned to look. Mars was on the buckboard. Trespasser was reined and stamping restlessly, thrashing his head. Johnny managed to sit and raised his arm feebly toward the wagon. But, but, but Lucy! Find her then. Hurry! Another wave of strength enabled him to his knees, and he managed to get one leg up. But then there was a searing passage of heat, and he saw flames. A black coat ran by, still hooded, carrying a fiery torch and intoning a long, modulated wail. He flung his arm and released the torch into the air. It struck the wagon, and immediately the canvas bloomed into a rose of flame. The petals overtook the one-eyed pyramids, the flying dragons fishtailed into the naked women. Mars! Johnny cried, his voice now fully formed. Mars was not on the buckboard, but he emerged suddenly and hurled something into the air. It was Johnny's backpack, and when it struck the ground, the mandolin case broke off and rolled across the dirt. Find her, clear light. Find your girl. Mars shook the reins and the horse bolted. The wagon lurched on two wheels, spitting sparks and smoke. A flaming tongue lapped down the rear axle and one wheel shuddered and jammed. For a while it was dragged by the other three. It bounced and snapped and fell and the floorboard slumped to a halt. There was a moment of silence like an inhaled breath. Then a great ball of fire ripped from the belly of the carriage, followed by a deafening roar. Bits of flaming debris filled the air and the staves collapsed. From the buckboard leapt Mars Daniel, completely engulfed in fire. He ran, screaming wildly, into the clearing. Trespasser, freed from his grasp, galloped off in the other direction, dragging the reins. Johnny's strength rushed back into him. He leapt to his feet and tackled Mars, throwing him to the ground and rolling him in the dirt, smothering the flames with his own body. Mars did not stop screaming. It was as if he could not inhale. He thrashed the ground and a steady stream of agony poured from his mouth. His clothes were charred and clung to his flesh. His face was covered with blisters and his hair was completely gone his blackened scalp smoldering. Johnny thrust his arms under Mars's back and knees and lifted him from the ground. His skin was still hot to the touch. The lifting made him scream all the louder. Johnny looked around. 
Black coats were still scurrying about the clearing, but fewer. Many had fled in one direction or another. There was a ridge and a line of green. Green meant water. Around some boulders, a swale bedded with moss and cattails. The stream was barely a trickle flowing beneath the moss. The good thing was that the boulder provided some shade from the morning sun already burning harsh in the hazy eastern sky. He laid Mars down in the cool moss. Mars winced. It hurts. It hurts. Make it stop. His words turned to more screaming. Johnny remembered something. Just lie still, he said. Breathe. Stay. He ran back to the clearing. Little fires of the wagon's remnant still flickered, but its structure was completely gone. Glass Darkly's body lay on its back. The head was completely gone, as was the knife. The rest of the body had been stripped naked. The genitals had been removed. All the black coats had scattered. Johnny could see their tiny shapes disappearing up the canyon into the arroyos across the prairie and up along the onyx highway. For a moment only, he wondered which one was Lucy. But there wasn't time to think about it. He snatched the backpack and started for the swale. Then, in an afterthought, he returned and retrieved the mandolin as well. Mars was still screaming. Johnny dug into his backpack and found the tiny glass vial in the deep pocket. Stay with me. I have something that might help you. He sat on a rock and cradled Mars's tortured head in his lap. Open, open. Johnny pried open his lips and emptied the elixir into the parched mouth, followed by a sip of cold water from his canteen. For a while, Marge, Mars continued shrieking while Johnny cradled his head and hovered his hands a breath above his face because it hurt too much to touch him. Little by little, the screams grew less urgent, and there were pauses longer and longer pauses, punctuated at first by gasps and sobs, giving away slowly to steady breathing, finally relaxing into a calm and steady cadence. Mars opened his eyes. What did you give me, Jimmy Clearlight? Johnny sighed. Some strong medicine the traveler gave me long ago. He said someday I might need it. Like to get me some more of that? Mars's voice was a grasshopper's rasp. He lifted one hand to his face and studied the blisters. He winced. Do I look terrible? Yes, you, you look terrible. Mars lowered his hand. It doesn't matter. I can see all the way now. I can see all the way through to the other side. I can see all the planets and God is moving them about with his stick. I can see the gates of Freeland and they're singing the little wolverines and the mermaids and the hummingbirds so loud. Music, I want music, clear light. Where's your mandolin? I've got it, I've got it right here. Play me, play me, clear light. Bring me to the moon. Johnny took off his shirt and pillowed it under Mars's head. He opened the case and strummed the strings. They were in perfect tune, which was impossible, but there it was perfect tune. He took it to his chest and began to play the only song he could still remember. Happy to meet, sorry to part. Oh, clear light, you send me home. 
You send me home to Freeland. He played the song over and over. Oh, clear light, clear light. Suddenly Mars drew a short, sharp breath. He tried to sit up, but he fell back. I can see it. It's coming like a great golden star falling from the moon. It's moving now. It's breaking free. Clear light, clear light. I'll see you again in the next world, Jimmy Clearlight. His head fell back and his eyes glazed over. He took one long in-breath, one long out-breath. There was silence. Out of the silence, he sat up once more, reached out his charred hand and pressed his fingers against Johnny's chest. I'll see you again, he said, in the next world. Johnny Arcane. Then he sank back down and his spirit left his body. Johnny felt it pouring out of his own chest and racing for the sky. His eyes were tearless. His mind was hushed. But the hush was broken by a voice, sharp, Intrusive. There he is. There's the man who killed Glass Darkly. Get him.